Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the post-lunch session, which in the overall program is session seven. And it should be quite fun because uh, I believe it's not really particularly business orientated. As the title suggests, it's about racing and its place in popular culture. Uh, and this is it from me because uh, taking over and guiding you through the session and moderating the panel discussion is none other than the literary editor of The Australian. So please welcome Mr. Stephen Ramey. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session of the Asian Racing Conference. Uh, yes, I'm Stephen Ramey. I'm the literary editor of the Australian newspaper, which is a national daily in Australia. And it does have on Mondays a very well-respected and well-read section called Thoroughbreds, uh, compiled by one of Australia's best racing writers, Tony Arold. So we're here today to talk about racing and popular culture, and I would add horses and popular culture. And I think with all the serious issues that are being discussed here, integrity in racing, the doping of horses, essentially things that turn the public off horse racing. It's important to remember that horse racing and horses have been part of popular culture for a very long time. And I think the role of administrators in the thoroughbred racing industry is to make sure that continues to be the case, particularly in this current time when there is so much competition for every sport, you don't want this sport to fall by the wayside. Now, I'm joined today by three distinguished guests. Firstly, Henry Bertels, who is standing at the other podium. Now, we're not having a podium contest here or anything like that. He, ha he has a, a, a sore back, so that's why he's standing. <laughs> And uh, he is the founder and managing director of H HBA Media Limited, which is essentially a company that works with uh, racing rights and it's trying to make horse racing more accessible and available to the general public. Now, he's also known as the racing poet because he writes poems about racing. <laughs> and today, <laughs> He is going to share a poem with you, specifically written for this very conference that we're attending. The second guest is Chris McGrath, who is a horse racing a journalist from England. He's worked at many well-known newspapers such as The Times and The Independent. And he has just published a book called Mr. Darley's Arabian which is a wonderful book. I recommend it to anyone who has not yet read it. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about that. And the third guest is John Duck Kim, who is Senior Manager at the Broadcast Centre of the Korean Racing Authority. And I believe he started his involvement in racing as a race caller. So what we have before us in this room, on this stage, is one poet, two journalists, and a race caller. I very much hope there are stewards still in the room. I will now, what's my zapper thing? Here it is. Right. I will now give a personal and fairly brief summary of the horse and racing in popular culture. Clearly what matters in any representation of popular culture is the written word. And the horse and racing in the written word has been going on since people have picked up pens or ch chisels to um, carve on stone tablets. But let's start with the person that everyone starts with at a time like this, because he's the best. Shakespeare. Can there be a more commonly known phrase in today's society, in society for years and years and years, centuries, than what Richard III says when he is dismounted from his horse at the Battle of Bosworth Field? 
A horse, a horse, I'd give my kingdom for a horse. He was a king who knew the value of horses. Funnily enough, what are we now, 425 years since then? The main owner of the Goldofen, Goldofen stables has both a kingdom and lots of fine horses. So we have moved on from Richard III's day. Funnily enough, in one of those you know, strange moments, the person that Richard III is saying that to on the battlefield is Catesby. And uh, Goldolphin has a horse running in Australia right now called Catesby, just one of those strange coincidences. But, of course, the interest in the horse predates William Shakespeare, and this is where I'm going to start the slide, if it works. Uh, forward. Ah, okay. All right, so quite a long time before Shakespeare, the Roman Emperor Galigula. There he is in a statue on his favourite horse, Incitatus. Now, it's well known that Galigula, when he was running Rome, thought it would be a good idea to turn his horse into a member of the government, to make him a consul. Whether that happened or not, we don't really know. But he does say at one point in his life, would that the Roman people had but one neck. One neck is something that uh, often separates horses from each other at the finishing post. But Galigula liked horses. He wasn't a great emperor. He wasn't a nice man, by all accounts, but he liked horses. Others who did include Marinengo, that's the horse. The gentleman sitting on him is Napoleon, the Emperor of France. He named every one of his war horses Marinengo. It was after a battle that he took part in. And in this photo from December 1812, Marinengo and Napoleon are fleeing Russia. They've just lost the Battle of Moscow. Interestingly, Marinengo went on to fight at the Battle of Waterloo, where he was taken prisoner of war. Returned to England, and as I'm sure Chris McGrath will know, went on to become somewhat of a stud in his adopted country. That was Napoleon leaving Russia. This is Russia winning the Melbourne Cup in Australia in 1946, by five lengths. I wasn't around to bet on him, but he's remembered as one of the good Melbourne Cup winners. Here we have a scene from Gulliver's Travels, the 1726 novel by Jonathan Swift. Towards the end of the novel, Gulliver, on his travels, ends up at the land of the Huanims. The Huanims are the horses. The difference between them and the horses we live with now is they were super intelligent, much smarter than humans, and ran their land beautifully. Interestingly, they had arranged marriages, the Huanims, and the reason they had them was to prevent the race from, from degenerating. Now, as Chris will tell you in his book, that's exactly what's happened in the real world. The Arabian who he's written about is kind of responsible for about 95% of all horses, all thoroughbred horses on this planet. Swift, when he was talking about the Huanims, described them as perfection of nature. And that's something that's hard to disagree with. All of us who love horses, who love the look of them, who love the action of them, understand that they are pretty close to a perfect living being. Of course, some are more perfect than others. I say that as someone who's been a gambler on the horses for about 35 years. Here's one 
that was more perfect than most. That's Secretariat, the American champion, who in, I've got those numbers there for a reason. 1973 was the year he won three races. They happened to be the Triple Crown. He is considered to be one of the great horses to ever race anywhere in the world. Now, I'll come to the 10 in a minute, but he's an example of a horse that inspired writers and filmmakers. You may remember the 2010 film about Secretariat. Now, when it came to casting that film, the American actor John Malkowitz played the trainer of Secretariat. The film itself was based on a novel published a few years earlier. So the writers and the filmmakers came together. But who played Secretariat? He certainly wasn't still around in 2010. Well, it's not on the cast list, but I can tell you that in fact five horses played Secretariat in that film. The one who appeared most often on screen was a horse named Trolley Boy. And he became a bit of a star in an equine acting sense and attended the red carpet premiere of the film in Hollywood. Now those five horses playing one horse in a film go to number 10. This is the, one of the many extraordinary things about Secretariat. When he died and they did an autopsy on him, they weighed his heart. It weighed 10 kilograms or 22 pounds to use the imperial measure. Now, the average horse heart weighs about 3.6 kilograms or 7.9 pounds. So his heart was almost three times as heavy, as big as the average horse's heart. And perhaps that's why, one of the reasons at least, he was such an inspiring horse that became not just the subject of books and films, but became part of the daily lives of people in America following their champion from race to race to race, as it happened in countries all over the world with other horses. In the UK, the most recent example might be Frankel, a descendant of the Arabian, by the way. Uh, in Australia at the moment, it's a horse named Winx. These are the horses that make racing and popular culture go hand in hand. They bring people to the track. <clears throat> There's another American champion about whom books and films have been made. His name is Seabiscuit. And he, I'm going to come to him now. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going backwards. Okay. Oh, I didn't get to see Biscuit, but I'll mention Steve Biscuit briefly. He was a champion racehorse. Uh, he was a subject of books. He was in a 1949 film with Shirley Temple. Not him, but he, the film was about him. And when they made the 2013 film about Sea Biscuit, 10 horses had to play him in the film. 10 different horses were Sea Biscuit on screen. Now, I don't know whether that was some sort of attempt to say, you know, we're bigger than Secretariat, we've got 10 horses playing Sea Biscuit, you only had five, but that's how it panned out. And that film is it's actually quite a beautiful film if you'd um, like to see it. Now here, we have something that in Australia is so hand in hand with popular culture that it almost exceeds Vegemite. I'm not talking about the American horse, I'm talking about the chocolate biscuit. It's called a Tim Tam. Every Australian would know what a Tim Tam is. They're probably eating one now somewhere in Australia. What they probably don't know is that its name, Tim Tam, is because one of the members, the family members of the Arnott's Biscuit Company that makes the biscuit was at the Kentucky Derby in 1958. And the winner of the derby that year was Tim Tam. I've chosen that photo of him after he won the Florida derby the same year, just so his name is there in black and white for everyone to see. It's not some story we've made up. The biscuit was named after a racehorse. 
I'll move on now to away from the US to England. This is why Dick Francis became an author, I think. Dick Francis, as I'm sure you know, is probably the most prolific and best known novelist writing about horse racing. He wrote 40 plus novels about horse racing. He started life, however, as a steeplechase jockey. In this photo here, it's in 1956, it's the Grand National, the most important steeplechase race in the UK, and he's riding a horse named Devon Locke, who was owned not just by a man in the street or a woman in the street, he was owned by Britain's Queen Mother. He had the race in his keeping, and the horse sat down. He didn't win from that position. This is why I think Dick Francis perhaps decided, well, there might be more money to be made out of being a writer. And interestingly, not long after this incident in the Grand National, he was asked how he felt that day, and he used the sort of prose that would go on to characterise his, his novels about racing direct and full of firepower, he said, it was a disaster of massive proportions. Interestingly, it makes me think of other horses who've done the wrong thing at the end of a race or at the end of their career. And that will take me on to an Australian, well, he's actually a New Zealander, Farlap. Farlap is the greatest horse Australia has ever seen. People can argue about that, and that's what sport's all about. We all like to argue about the differences between people of different generations, but he was the best. That quote up there, this is not a horse, Harry, this is a cross between a sheepdog and a kangaroo, is what an American promoter said when he was visiting Australia at the time to Harry Telford, the owner, when he first saw Farlap as a very young horse. Now, as it happens, I own a sheepdog and I've seen plenty of kangaroos. And I can tell you that whilst both are quite fast, they're not as fast as Farlap. He was the fastest, he was the best. And he went on, of course, to be written about in books. And in 1983, Australia made a film about him, just called Farlap, Heart of the Nation, I think was the subtitle. And the screenplay for that was written by one of Australia's greatest playwrights, David Williamson. And it's that connection between someone who's otherwise considered external to horse racing, a playwright such as David Williamson, or a novelist such as Mark Twain, who wrote about the Melbourne Cup when he visited Australia, or the English writer Nat Gould, or Dick Francis. These, this connection between artists and the horse and racing is one of the things that connects it with the general public. When you have a film about a horse, when you have a book about a horse, everyone can sort of take part in a sport that they may not have been interested in before. To stay with Australia, I'm going to finish up with our two best horses of the past decade. Uh, uh, okay. I'm not one of them, but that is me. That is me on, the, uh, on, on your left, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> with uh, Black Caviar, the mighty, undefeated, 25 races, 25 wins, sprinting mare. I was interviewing her ahead of her 14th win. And I have to say, I've interviewed a lot of people in my life. She was just about the easiest. She didn't say a lot, but every word I valued. I wanted to show that photo of myself and Black Caviar because I'm holding her head. In fact, she tried to eat my jacket at the time. She was very attracted by the 
corduroy for some reason. After I spoke to Black Caviar, I went to speak to her trainer, Peter Moody, who's in the next photograph. And I said to him, what was it about Black Caviar that first attracted you to her when she was a yearling, when you first spotted her? And he looked at me and he said, and this is the start of the quote I've included, she had such a big, powerful... Now, he's a Queenslander, so I'm just going to say the word he used. Ass. I looked at him, thinking he was joking, and he looked at me hard and said, I always look for the biggest ass. After all, that is kind of what drives a horse, I suppose. Black Caviar is the subject of a book. It came out in 2013. And, you know, I would be very surprised if uh, movie-making people aren't also interested. Black Caviar is also one of the horses that taps in to the changing nature of media around the world. Farlap didn't have a Twitter account. Black Caviar does. If you want to follow Black Caviar on Twitter, you're free to. She's part of that attempt to try to connect horse racing with the younger generation. The final horse I'm going to mention is still racing. This is Winx, the greatest horse currently racing in Australia. She also has a Twitter account, by the way, and she also is the subject of uh, a book that's coming out next month. I wanted to put that number there, 130. It's not her racing record. Her racing record is one, 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 one. It goes on for quite a long time. 130 is her time form rating. She has now been declared the best thoroughbred racing in the world on turf at the moment. And as someone who has been following horse racing for a long time, it's horses like Winx that connect the sport to the popular culture because people will go to the races just to see Winx. They will put bets on her and not cash in the winning ticket, but hold on to it as a souvenir of their little part in history. So I think that in this conference where we are talking about lots of serious issues and deservedly so, we do need to remember that perhaps the most important aspect of racing is the horse. The horse comes first, and I don't mean that just in past the post first. The animal is what connects us to the sport, and it's what's connected various writers, filmmakers, and poets to the sport. Thank you. So now we're going to go to Henry, who is going to read from his poem that he wrote just for this conference. Hello. Thank you, Stephen. Um, well said. It is all about the horse. Um, but I did write this. I think this is the first poem I've actually ever written about a conference, um, which is not a particularly romantic thing. But um, <clears throat> nevertheless, it is to do with the sport that we all love. This is called uh, Kamsa Hamnida, which is thank you in Korea. And it's dedicated to the Asian Racing Federation who've put on this conference. In years long gone, in different times when progress wore a selfish cloak, when people firmly gave no ground and Unity was thought a joke, a wisdom rose amongst the ranks of visionaries who've earned our thanks, who saw beyond their borderline, beyond their remit, national gain, who chose a way to redefine those boundaries colored by dis disdain. A modernizing outlook born where close collaboration drew collective thought, exchange, goodwill, and betterment, a worldly view that racing now could celebrate, alliance in the corporate space where bright ideas and brainstorming 
collided for a better place where all the nuts and bolts discussed that underpin its glorious form, compliance, law, integrity, such things that make the public yawn essential, essentials for our sport to shine, debated hard below the line. But more than this, encouragement, support, promotion, nourishment, and all quite simply that's required to make our product more desired. For we are here to find a way. It's what we strive for every day. To do what we know must be right. To keep that burning torch alight. To make the sport of kings once more a king of sports. Just as before. And we are blessed with so much scope. And so much more than dreams and hope. The stories... Oh, the stories and the grace, the power, the glories, the majesty, the passion. Though it's not for some, the fashion. With guile, ideas, the time is now. Think digital. Think why and how. And with a winks and with a smile, think on our feet. Think Gangnam style. Let's give our bodies, give our whole, give our minds, our heart and soul. To you, the noble ARF upon whose shoulders duty rests, assembled here in South Korea and elsewhere every other year, from conference guests both near and far, a gracious Kamsar Hamnida. Thank you in our language. Thank you. And now, Chris McGrath. His book is wonderful. It is not just a book about horse racing, it's a social history of Britain over 300 years. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Henry. I've now heard a poem containing the word compliance, which is surely unprecedented. <laughs> Just want to pull you up on one thing, Stephen. There were 11 sea biscuits in Sea Biscuit, and the 11th is a bit of a spoiler because if you've seen the film or you know, read the book, which is excellent, it's all brewing up to this big showdown with War Admiral, the big match race. And there's, if you've been to Santa Anita, as the tensions rise and the horse is being laid around the paddock, there's just a bit of a clue to what happens because he keeps walking past the statue of Seabiscuit. <laughs> right, let me just uh, tell you about... Uh, well, it wasn't a typical recent day in my working life, but it was a typical day in racing terms. I did two interviews in one day. The first one was with the Duke of Roxburgh at his castle, the Scottish borders. Now his stud farm had produced the champion filly attraction, whose uh, son by the great Frankel was sold to Sheikh Hamdan for 1.6 million guineas as a yearling. And he was uh, running l later that week as one of the favorites for the first classic of the season. This is the, the, the largest inhabited building in Scotland, uh, filled with art, art treasures um, brought across by the Duke's grandmother, who was an American heiress. So that was the morning shift. Um, one bus and several trains later, that evening, I was in an industrial estate outside Manchester in a, a sort of cabin office surrounded by cement lorries talking to a man called David Armstrong. Uh, David started with nothing. He had to borrow money to buy a couple of rusty old trucks. But he now has 27 uh, thoroughbred broodmares. He'd never even been racing it was seven or eight or nine years ago. 
And he went reluctantly because his brother-in-law had a ticket to an evening meeting at Haydock Park. His brother-in-law had no intention of leaving the bar at any stage. He was perfectly happy there, just drinking and staring at the women. And David wanted some air. So he stepped out and he saw the runners from the previous race uh, being washed down and the steam rising into the evening sun. And he did not move from the spot for the rest of the evening. He was entranced. He went home and he told his wife that they were going to sell their racing pigeons and breed racehorses. And very soon he bred a champion sprinter, Mason, and he's got a new homebred star, Mabs Cross, who's, also he who's heading to Royal Ascot next month. So here were two men from completely opposite ends of the social spectrum but united by the same obsession. And as such, it's a typical snapshot of the sheer breadth of humanity that's always convened on the racetrack. And it's for that reason I set out to write a rather different type of racing history. Because as Stephen just said, the 300 year history of the thoroughbred is also the history of society during that time. Thoroughbreds have always been luxury goods, status symbols, and their ownership is, it's an index of the changing complexion of wealth. Remember the Duke's grandmother was an American industrial heiress. Now here's a, here's a, one of my favorite examples is the um, 1873 Derby winner, a horse called Doncaster. He raced in the silks of one of the ultimate self-made men of the Industrial Revolution, James Merry, a Scotsman of obscure origins who had combined being in the right place at the right time with a complete freedom from scruples and was so able to build up an empire of coal mines and iron foundries, but he could never achieve respectability in the eyes of the landed aristocracy whose long social and economic and political hegemony was being broken up by new money like this. Mary acquired all the badges of kudos he could. He became a member of parliament, though only after um, the first time he won the seat, he was unseated for bribery, but uh, the second time he obviously paid enough. Um, he bought a townhouse in Eaton Square and a shooting estate in the Highlands, but above all, he bought racehorses. And uh, he actually, uh, he won three of the five classics in 1873, and they carried the silks made famous by horses raced over a century earlier by the Earls of Grosvenor, but which had been allowed to lapse. So by acquiring these famous yellow and black colours, he gave a, a literal expression to the transfer of wealth and power from its traditional base in, in land to the new industrial money. I, I, I saw a copy of the Sunday Times flying over here on uh, uh, and um, I don't know if you saw it, because they have the new rich list in. Great big headline across uh, the top of the front page. At last, the self-made rich triumph over old money. But this has been going on for 150 years at least. Now, it so happened that the heir to the Grosvenor fortune, the Grosvenor that I just mentioned, whose racing colours he'd taken on, he happened to include in his his own vast estates, a marsh on the fringe of London that had now been drained. So he in turn was able to benefit from the explosion in the urban economy and built expensive, fashionable new housing in what we know today as Mayfair and Belgravia. And he was duly elevated to become first Duke of Westminster. And he decided to revive the family stud. And he saw that this horse Doncaster, James Mary's Derby winner, had the potential to be a great stallion, a great that patriarch to, found, to, found, to revive the stud. But he could not bring himself to deal directly with a man whose father was reputed to have been an itinerant peddler and who had usurped his own family's um, racing colours. So instead it was arranged that the horse's trainer would give Mary £10,000 for Donkster. And this, this was an unprecedented sum for a, a thoroughbred at the time. A few days later, the Duke of Westminster gave the trainer 14000 he would rather pay 40% more than pay a lesser sum 
into the hands that would never be cleansed in his mind of the stain of Glaswegian soot. And Donkster duly became an important stallion, in, uh, in fact, a key link in this chain that um, is kind of the apparatus of this book that Stephen briefly referred to there. Um, that 19 out of 20 horses in any race, and I mean, people come here from all over the world, but from the Korean Derby to the Grand National Kentucky Derby, Melbourne Cup, in all those races, on average, 19 out of 20 horses will descend through the sire line to a stallion imported from the Syrian desert by a Yorkshire merchant, Thomas Darley, at the turn of the 18th century. Thomas Darley never made it home from Aleppo. I discovered in researching my book that he was killed as a result of all things from a fall, of a fall um, from, a, from, a, from a horse. But the species that ended his life also made him immortal because this stallion, though he only produced a couple of dozen recorded folds on an obscure provincial stud, ultimately established this sire line that has all but eradicated the, the, the two others, um, the tracing to those other patriarchs that we all know, Godolphin, Arabian, Bailey, Turk, still very resonant names, but almost entirely effaced from modern pedigrees. Now, clearly, we're, we're just talking about sons of sons of sons. The top line of a pedigree, is, if, if you envisage the way it fantail, the fish tails out, and to concentrate on that, it's convenient. It's, it's, it does oversimplify things, but the, the, the monopoly he's virtually established is still astonishing. And as I say, it provided the perfect apparatus on which I could drape the many colored tapestry of the turf's social history. So I decided to follow this sire line across 25 generations from the Dali Arabian to Frankel and to use each stallion in that sequence as a portrait of the changing world on and off the racetrack. Now, the good news was that this produced a panorama far beyond the sport, though the foreground colour provided by horses and horsemen uh, was itself, of course, abundant. Well, the bad news was that my research was soon wildly out of control. Because we've already noted that the thoroughbred charts the distribution of wealth and for much of its history that has meant equally the distribution of power and as a result each of these stallions would typically take me immediately into the heart of great moments in the history of nations and two of those 25 for instance were bred by prime ministers so time after time no matter how unpromising the initial outline of a particular stallion seemed to be when I first started my research I would find myself very soon immersed in great events and trends and changes in the wider world. Um, and that took me into settings as varied as the Jacobite Rising of 1745, the Butcher of Culloden, um, as, as, as um, the Scotsmen know him, bred the Great Eclipse, the American War of Independence, the Diamond Rush in South Africa, prostitution in Georgian London, uh, the rise of the ranchero aristocracy on the Argentine pampas, even the fact that Lucchino Visconti was only able to make such cinematic masterpieces as The Leopard because he abandoned a first career as a trainer in which he'd threatened to become the nemesis of none other than Federico Tezio. And of course, two world wars, the torpedo that sank the ship carrying E.P. Taylor, whose rescue, which was a, a, a a, a, a big price at the time um, enabled him to breed the great northern dancer and the most influential sire of them all is a horse called Phalaris who doesn't have half the um, fame he deserves. He raced during the First World War for Lord Derby. Uh, Lord Derby started the Pals regiments and he succeeded Lord George at the war office after Asquith left Downing Street. Um, Asquith, then a broken man by the death of his brilliant son, Raymond, who happened to be the brother-in-law of the trainer of Phalaris. So you see, it, you're constantly being, it, you didn't have to shoehorn these stories. They just fell into your lap, you know. 
So whatever little merit my book might have, I can guarantee that no racing book has ever had a bibliography like it because I had to explore all these kind of chaotically proliferating strands of history. But I also had to try and weave them into a central and hopefully more coherent theme, and that was the history of racing itself. So as such, I also had to read every worthwhile syllable that was in, in, in the sport's own uh, great literature. And since you're all here for the love of racing, rather than interested in diamond mines or bordellos, let me conclude by picking out one or two gems that would re reward the interest of anyone uh, who shares our love of the sport. Now, one book many of you will already know, I suspect, is Men and Horses I Have Known by the trainer of Phalaris, George Lambton. Uh, in telling the story of Phalaris, I found the most interesting story, uh, material uh, in um, the marvellous kind of bohemian circles in which um, Lambton had married. But Lambton, um, in writing about the turf, he's proved a very, he's a very elegant writer with a gift for condensing all these rich racing characters of his era, who, who he knew intimately, with few very confident, judicious strokes of insight and anecdote. So if, you, if you've not read that, um, that is an authentic classic. I imagine fewer of you are familiar with the works of three earlier writers who in effect created the genre of turf literature, all three of whom used nom de plume, presumably because in those days no gentleman would admit to earning his living writing about the turf, a situation some of you may consider unchanged. The pioneer was the Druid. The most authoritative and comprehensive was Nimrod. But for me, the pick was Sylvanus, which is the name used by a man called Robert Colton. And he just wrote one book of, of interest to us in 1850. It's called The Bylanes and Downs of England with Turf Scenes and Characters. Um, and you can read it on archive.org or you can get copies printed out nowadays. You don't have to buy a, um, a book that's 170 years old, which is rather expensive, but it is, no one's read it. And it's, it's just a joy. It's just teeming with wonderful um, characters and stories. And he, he, he writes very well. Um, fine storytellers of more recent times include John Welcome, John Fairfax Blaybra, and a man with a an eye for a ripped bodice called Henry Blythe. He's, his, his little stories are, always, uh, are all very good and worth tracking down. But of course, only a couple of weeks ago, we lost a, a modern master, Bill Knack, um, who wrote the Secretariat book on which the film was based. And if you can only manage one short swig from the cellar of, 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 of racing's history, um, I'd recommend, um, it's just an article you wrote for Sports Illustrated, um, Blood Brothers and the Bluegrass, which is in a collection uh, which is called My Turf. And there are a few other fantastic um, racing sketches in that, as well as boxing and other things. So that would be my three against the field. Um, George Lambton, Men and Horses I've Known, Sylvanus, um, and Bill Knack, uh, My Turf. Um, just to wrap up, uh, however interested we are in recording deeds of horses and horsemanship, and that's after all why we're here as industry professionals, what gives our world a sort of sustainable vitality is, is its broader colour and diversity. Um, already at this conference we've devoted a lot of thought to the challenge of growing the 21st century racing brand, but whatever innovations might be profitably explored, we must always recognize that the defining, the defining abiding importance of heritage and make sure we build a future respectfully rooted in the past. And the richest part of that heritage uh, is the way the horse unites people from all walks of life. Um, in the very first sentence of his book, Sylvanus celebrates the encouragement of the noble pastime by all ranks, shades, sects, and sexes. Um, 
or you could put it another way, in the old aphorism, all mankind is equal in only two places, on the turf and six feet under it. Thank you. And now it's a pleasure to introduce John Doc Kim, who is going to talk about horse racing and Korea specifically. Good afternoon. My name is Jong Do Kim, and I'm the team leader of KRA Broadcasting Center and Race Caller at Seoul Race Course. I'm honored to be here today. Can you start with telling you the story about a disaster? In 2003, Typhoon Mami swept through Korea. It was the worst typhoon in living memory. The damage was beyond our imagination and it took more than two years to recover. Of course, it was the people and infrastructure were the priority in the aftermath. However, later, we rediscovered some of outstanding cultural DNA of Korea. The oldest boat, and possibly we think the world's most ancient boat, was uncovered near Busan. It turns out the boat was over 8,000 years old and was about 3,400 years old than Great Pyramid of Khufu in Egypt. We realized that our ancestors had shipbuilding skill and a maritime culture much earlier than previously thought. I was a moment of disaster, but we overcame it. And also we gained pride with the discovery of this cultural milestone. Well, the horse racing industry has suffered its own typhoon. Sales decreased, race course attendance dropped, and we lost customers to other betting mediums. I believe race clubs everywhere else around the world are systematically trying to increase turnover through innovation. We, the Korea Racing Authority, are also striving to save the racing industry by expanding TV broadcasting attracting more host owners, and constantly seeking new solutions. We saw that by creating a link between hosts and people, revolving around the proudest host culture, we could re-energize the host racing industry and make people proud about enjoying host racing. As of last year, KRBC, the Korea Racing Broadcasting Channel, has started a project creating multimedia art to revive the forgotten Korean host culture. So, now let me show you how we delivered it. The Forgotten World, Korean Horse Culture. Horse, built a country. Park is the third most popular Korean family name after Kim or Lee. Park Yok Gose, the father of Parks, was born in the horse's egg. 2,000 years ago, six village chiefs gathered in the southeastern part of the peninsula, planning to form a country. They searched for a king over and over again, but they couldn't find a suitable one. Then, one day, they heard a noise. They traced the unusual sound and found a white horse kneeling in tears. As they approached, the white horse flew up into the sky and vanished and there was a purple egg left at the place where the white horse had been. As the chief carefully touched the egg, the egg cracked, and a baby boy was found smiling inside of it. 
The chiefs consider this mysterious phenomenon to be the king sent from the sky and named him Yokkose, which means lights up the world, and Park for his last name because he came from an egg which was shaped like a gourd, called Park in Korean. Park Yokkose, Shilla's first king who gave birth to the spirits of art, culture, and style. Since then, Shilla has been reborn after the unification of Goguryeo and Baekje as the unified Shilla. It is called the Golden Empire, the most famed of delicate gold crafting skills which is priceless in Korean history. Horse helped win battles. Like the Legion of Rome, as well as the Spartans, there was a robust combat unit in Korea called Gemamusa. Goguryeo, which expanded its territory up to Beijing, China, was in conflict for 700 years with China's enormous empire. The powerful combat unit of Goguryeo was the so-called Gemamusa, which had dressed both the horse and knight in armor. Goguryeo, which possessed the world's best steel technology at that time, had an armored spear that was more than 5 meters long and weighed about 70 kilograms. When combined with the weight of an adult man, the total weight was approximately 120 kilograms. Therefore, the Gema Musas required an extraordinary horse, and Guaha horses were the perfect solution for this. The height of Guaha horse was about 110 centimeters, and it was small enough to be able to pass under a fruit tree, even with a person on its back. It also had a gentle personality. Despite its appearance, it had outstanding immunity and extraordinary strength and power which was superior to any other horse species. Due to the Guaha horse, it was possible for Gema Musas to dominate in a way similar to a division of tanks. Now the days of Guaha horses on the battlefields are gone. But don't worry, there is a place where you can still see Guaha horses race. Let's Run Park at Jeju Island has Guaha horse racing every week and it's the only place in the world where this occurs. Unlike thoroughbreds, they have endurance that make tight finishes frequent. Horse gave entertainment. A sport similar to modern polo was played in Korea from the period of the Three Kingdoms to the Joseon Dynasty. It was called Gyokgu and was a national sport for all ages, from young to old and king to the poor. It was a game where a one meter long bamboo pole with a ring on the end was used to carry or hit a lacquered wooden ball into the opposition's goal while riding a horse. If the hammer hit the ball, the tip would act like a spoon, making it possible to swing the ball freely. It is also a place where players could showcase their skill and style. From this, various technologies gradually developed, and it became the best military martial art beyond the sport at the start of the Joseon era. Playing Gyoku was a vital skill. If they couldn't play it, they couldn't qualify as a knight. But it no longer remains as a popular sport. Fortunately, we started a cultural restoration project for Gyoku in the 2000s. We would like Gyoku to become a popular sport for all ages once again. Horse becomes a hero. There was a racehorse called Morning Sun that served in the U.S. Marine Corps during the Korean War. Morning Sun was a mare that ran at the first racetrack in Shinsodong, Seoul. She was the first horse to cross the finish line and step onto the track like the Morning Sun. However, after the Korean War broke out, the owner's sister stepped on a mine and became disabled. Eventually, the owner had no choice but to sell Morning Sun to the U.S. Marines as a shipping horse. The money allowed him to buy his sister a prosthetic leg. In October 1952, her fate had suddenly changed from a racehorse to a supply horse of ammunition during combat. Unlike other timid shipping horses, Morning Sun was smart, charming, and also energetic. 
She was only 400 kilograms, but made more than 50 trips from the ammunition dump to the front line, even though she was injured. This was considered impossible. The goddess Phila may have been reborn as a horse. She is courageous. It's absurd. So much respect and many compliments followed. And unlike other nameless horses, she was given a name, Reckless. She gave comfort, courage, and hope to soldiers who were burnt out from the war. Soldiers wanted her to stay with them in their barracks, even though she had a separate stable. The soldiers loved her so much, they took off their bulletproof vests and protected her for fear of her getting hurt. We have stopped the shooting. That means much to the fighting men and their families. After the signing of the ceasefire, Reckless was moved to the United States and served at the Marine Corps' 1st Division headquarters in California. She was promoted to sergeant in 1959 and then retired the following year with a grand discharge ceremony. After her discharge, she received various medals and citations, such as the Purple Heart for injured combat soldiers from the War from America, the U.S. Presidential Citation, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the United Nations Commander-in-Chief, and the Korean Presidential Citation. After a comfortable and peaceful life, she died in 1968, leaving three progeny behind. The U.S. Marines held a military funeral and placed her to rest in peace in the Army unit. Even now, she is remembered and loved by many people. There is a monument next to her stables, and the official website Sergeant Reckless is in operation. So, how do you perceive Korean horse culture? KRBC believes that the missing link between connect horses to the public is the forgotten horse culture, and this in turn will bring them closer to racing. Last year, we presented artwork of the world's longest screen, the Vision 127, at Seoul Race Course. From the Paralytic wall paintings of the Cave of Lascaux to Leonardo da Vinci and Rubens, 30 masterpieces from the East and West were reborn onto the world's most extensive media art platform on the 127 meter long full screen. This year, KRBC has created other mediums to complement the media art. In terms of promoting host culture, we are holding an exhibition of 100 art pieces under the theme of beautiful hosts at Seoul Lace Course. Also, KRBC is putting effort into combining the latest IT technology, host culture racing within various fields to get closer to the public. Webtoon have emerged as the center of the digital content market optimized for the mobile area. So we are planning to launch a horse racing webtoon series called Tre. It is a story about a virtual reality race to be held at the Korea Cup in 2020. And it captures the enthusiasm, passion, dreams, and the love of apprentice jockeys. We are in the process of developing virtual reality and augmented reality. Using VR, the public can experience horse racing more realistically. AR can be used to get a much closer look at horse's condition in the parade ring. We also created automated mobile chatting technology, which will provide racing information and videos that are accessible anytime, anywhere, through mobile phone chat applications. The future of the racing industry might seem murky at the moment. There is no doubt that it is necessary for us to continue on striving to get racing closure to the public through technological innovations. To rekindle the DNA of our equestrian heritage, KRBC will continue to be the pioneer bringing horse racing closure to an exciting and popular culture. Thank you.
Thank you very much to all of you. Stephen, the word came down from above that uh, the time has run out, so unfortunately we won't get to hear any personal observations from the panelists, but great contributions from all four of you. Uh, we're going to have a very short break now, and then we've got two very important sessions, because after all, what is racing without the horse? So we're going to be looking at the issues of gene doping and veterinary regulation. I said the word properly for the second time today. <laughs> See you after the coffee. Thanks very much. Thank Good you. Thanks, Chris. Really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.